Hello again, Fight Fans. I'm Michael Montero, and you're watching The Neutral Corner for the week of November 14th. All right, so we got a lot to talk about. Got a great episode for you guys. And, uh, whoa, whoa, do you hear that? That's a smoke detector. Oh, my God, the heat's coming. The fire's coming. Oh my God, what are we going to do? We are firemen. Got it, coach. The heat doesn't bother us. We live in the heat. We train in the heat. Yeah, let's go. It tells us that we're ready. We're at home. We're where we're supposed to be. Flames don't intimidate us. What do we do? We control the flame. We control them. We move the flame where we want to. Let's go. <sighs> Gotta get a pump. So motivated. So inspired. I can rip a dinosaur in half. I can box Sasquatch. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, that wasn't very professional. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Ring walk. Today's question comes via Tussle Man on Twitter, and it reads, I was wondering if you could touch on a subject I have been wondering about for a while now. A lot was made of how Rios looked in the weigh-in and his rehydration weight when he took the ring. My question is, when a fighter struggles to cut weight so much, how much energy strength does he get back when he rehydrates? At what percent will he be when he takes the ring and how long until he feels 100% again? Okay, so you're probably gonna be pissed at my answer because the, the, the real answer is it depends on the fighter. There's, well, first of all, let me give a little background for those of you who don't know. Uh, of course, last Saturday, Brandon Rios fought against uh, Timothy Bradley in Las Vegas. It was a welterweight title fight. Brandon Rios failed to make weight at first. He was 147.2. He came back later and made weight 147. He looked like an absolute ghost. And, you know, we all noticed that. I mean, you guys have probably seen the pictures and everything by now. But everybody at the weigh-in, I mean, Brandon Rios has always been pale. He, he's, a, he's a, you know, very white skin. But, man, he looked like Casper the Ghost at that weigh-in. He looked really, really, really pale. And um, you could just see almost the zombie kind of look on him, right? The, the next night at the fight, he came in at 170 pounds. I didn't stutter, 170 pounds. So he gained 23 pounds in a little more than 24 hours. And I mean, just right off the top of my head, I, that's probably like 15, 16%, uh, I'm thinking uh, body weight, you know, regain. That shows severe dehydration. And I didn't learn until really today through some sources I heard that uh, Rios came into camp at 190 pounds. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that more later in the episode, but just to put in perspective, you know, how, how much Rios had struggled. Look, there, there are certain um, uh, sanctioning bodies that have a 30 day weigh in period for championship fights and you have to weigh within 10% of the division weight, right? Uh, recent example, right, is, uh, that I could just, I don't know, it's popping in my head right now, is Mayweather Pacquiao. 30 days out, Mayweather weighed in at 150.5 pounds. He had to weigh 147. So some sanctioning bodies, I think that was the WBC. I know they mandate that 30-day weigh-in. Then there's sanctioning bodies. I think the IBF has one where you can only rehydrate to a certain weight percentage. I think that's also 10%. So 10% seems to kind of be the number. Don't quote me. If the, the percent might be a little different than that, but it's about 10%. But the, the real honest answer is it depends on the fighter. It depends on your age. It depends on your lifestyle outside the ring. And it also depends on what weight you come into camp at. For Brandon Rios, <clears throat> who's uh, in his late 20s now, but he's an old late 20s, right? Coming into camp at 190 pounds, cutting what? 40 something pounds in camp of straight up fat, but some of that's gonna be muscle as well, right? It's debilitating when you cut muscle. Really, really debilitating. Um, then you regain 23 pounds of basically water weight. That's just straight up water weight and blubber. Putting your body through that process within, I don't know, eight weeks, 12 weeks maximum, Every fighter has a different camp, you know, some 
it's just eight weeks, some it's as much as 12 weeks. But putting your body through that, it's one thing to do that when you're 21 years old. Some guys have, I, I've seen guys literally cut weight like that and have no effect. They look perfectly strong the next day after gaining that kind of weight back, straight up water weight. But then you see guys later in their career, it really starts to take an effect. And for Brandon Rios, you know, obviously it had a major, major effect on him. So there's really no science to it. But I, I think that the Association of Boxing Commissions needs to come together and mandate some uh, some protocol with this stuff. Like as I mentioned, with the you know certain sanctioning bodies have protocol, but they all kind of do their own thing, and then different state athletic commissions do their own thing. I know here in California, I shadowed the commission back in June when uh, Bradley fought Jesse Vargas. And the, Andy Foster, the head of the commission here, said that it is definitely a concern of the California State Athletic Commission, the, the extreme cutting of weight and regaining of weight. And the commission here, <clears throat> they of course do MMA as well as boxing. And I guess, you know, I don't know much about MMA, but apparently it's an even bigger problem in MMA. And Andy Foster showed me a, a sheet of just the percentage of body weight of you know weight gain and loss from like i don't know the last six months of fights that they had put on here in california and it was alarming man you're talking some of these guys you know 15 16 upwards of 20 percent of their body weight that they put on that they cut and put back on that takes a toll man and if you're a guy like brandon rios who depends on that energy. You know, he's a brawler, he's, he wasn't a boxer, he was never a boxer. You depend on that energy, there's just no way your body is gonna keep up. Timothy Bradley obviously knew that, took advantage of that, we'll talk more about that later. But yeah, I'm sorry, man, I can't give you a clear cut answer. There's no set number, but I do think that this is something that the Association of Boxing Commissions needs to look into. They need to do some studies. I think the California State Athletic Commission is ahead of the game. They've started doing those studies. We're gonna see the results of it over the next couple years because it just really began. But it's a big, big issue in this sport. We could eliminate it by going to same day weigh-ins, but that's never happening. That, that's never going to go back to where it was. We're going to stick with the weigh-ins the day before. That's just how it is now. So studies need to be done and there needs to be cohesion with all the athletic commissions and all the sanctioning bodies. The guys doing this extreme weight gain and loss, it, it's really, really affecting their health, but it's also affecting the fight. Look, I'll be honest, if I knew Brandon Rios, came into camp at 190 pounds for this fight with Bradley, if I knew, if I could have known that he was gonna rehydrate to 170, there's no way in hell I would have gone around telling people it was gonna be a competitive fight. You guys all saw my fight preview, right? I was saying, Bradley Rios is gonna be competitive. Don't sleep on this fight. Well, shit. How am I supposed to know that the guy had a really horrible camp unless I'm going up to the gym and hanging out with him? I don't have time to go up to all the gyms here in Los Angeles and watch every fighter during their camp. So it not only affected guys like me in the media who are you know, trying to give analysis, preview of the fight, it affects the guys in Vegas, the bookmakers, it affects the people taking bets, it also affects the fans that may have driven or flown into Vegas to actually watch that fight. So it's not just up to the fighter to have the responsibility to, to make weight and all that. The people in charge in boxing need to get some control over this because it's just an extra additional thing among the plethora of things that could piss fans off and get them going to another sport. Okay, that's my rant. So we had a lot of action both on this side of the pond and over in the UK. Let's talk about the, the biggest fight last week in the UK. Uh, Callum Smith scored a first round knockout, a really impressive knockout over Rocky Fielding. There was three knockdowns in that first round and he improves to 18-0 with 13 knockouts. Really, really good looking super middleweight prospect. I'm not ready to call this guy a contender. But six foot three, 
25 year old super middleweight man i mean that's impressive the guy that tall that can get down that weight very very rangy really really impressive win over fielding for this stage of his career but fielding you know wasn't you know a, a top guy or anything like that fielding's biggest claim to fame was um stopping brian vera uh, you know rugged uh, journeyman type of guy earlier this year so for Callum Smith to go out and score that kind of a win very very impressive the super middleweight division is void of stars right now the last stars it had was Carl Frotch and and you know obviously Andre Ward was the kingpin I don't know if you call him a star but he's absolutely the kingpin of that division but Andre Ward's moved up to light heavyweight Carl Frotch is retired there's Rumors he could come back to possibly fight Golovkin. There's been some, you know, talk about that, but I'm not going to buy into any of that right now. So with this super middleweight void, there's a couple of PBC guys that are just kind of trading titles and stuff. I'm not really excited about any of them. But there's, you know, this Callum Smith guy coming up the rankings, and there's a couple of these super middleweight title holders are from the UK, right? They fight over there. So... Maybe it sets up some interesting fights coming up over the next two, three years. But let's not get too excited, okay? Very good-looking prospect. He still needs another win or so before I'll consider him a real credible contender. And then there was the big card here in Las Vegas from the Thomas and Max Center. I was ringside for this one along with Tiffany Lamb. Let's start with the co-feature. Uh, Vasil Lomachenko scores a 10th round knockout over Mexican Ramulo Kosicha. Uh... Lomachenko looked good, right? He, uh, I tweeted about it during the fight. I, I love his movement, the, the distance he, he fights at, the angles, the, the timing, the footwork, all of it. Really, really looked impressive in this fight. But, um, again, this is one of those where, you know, we shouldn't get too excited, right? The guy he was fighting was a limited fighter. Uh, I didn't see the HBO broadcast but i saw on twitter and i've heard some some chatter on the internet since that some of the guys during the fight the commentators were just fawning over lomachenko and going crazy and having the pound for pound talks and of course then other names start to get mentioned and um, some of the chatter going online is well this is kind of disrespectful to guillermo rigandau because HBO didn't exactly fawn over Guillermo Rigondeaux the same way they are over Vasil Lomachenko. And um, there's some double standards and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do a video addressing that, all right? Um, for the record, HBO gave Rigondeaux a try, and he, he just wasn't very exciting. Now, for my cup of tea, Lomachenko's not that exciting either. But he is more exciting than Rigondeaux because the body language is different he actually it, it seems like lomachenko wants to be great it seems like he likes boxing that's just the body language from the guy doesn't have the best personality in the world has no desire to learn english has no desire to live in the states and be a crossover guy but he has a genuine desire to be great and and everybody that's uh, covered lomachenko and followed him Every interview you read, you can tell that's a concern. That That's a goal, is to be great, is to win championships. A guy like Rigondeaux, it really, really seems like he doesn't particularly even like boxing. He basically does it because it's a way to make money. But on this night, Lomachenko looked very, very good. Scores a knockout, you know. Um, I believe it's from a body shot, and uh, that's something that he doesn't do very often. I don't think he punches with that much power. He still has some of those amateur habits where it's pity pat with the shots. But he throws punches from so many angles. He's so fast. He's hard to hit very clean. You know, I'd love to see him against some of these top guys at featherweight, but the featherweight division is very fractured politically. You have the Al Heyman people, you like the PBC featherweights, and they're going to stay in their own universe. And then you have the, the Golden Boy top rank universe. But then you have some of these overseas promoters, right? Uh, the guys over in Asia and Europe, they're kind of doing their own thing with some of their guys. So 122, 126, I think, are the two 
I think, deepest divisions in boxing. There's so many great fights that could be made, especially if guys would be willing to move up or down a few pounds. But they're so fractured. They're also the most fractured divisions in boxing. And that's going to hurt Lomachenko. He just needs to keep, stay active. He's not going to get more than about two fights a year. Get in the ring twice a year. Beat your guys. Look good doing it. And at some point, though, in the next two years or so, he needs to move up to 130 pounds and start taking on those guys there. And in the main event, Timothy Desert Storm Bradley, who you guys know is one of my favorite fighters in boxing, just proves why he's so damn great. He scores a ninth round knockout over a shot to shit branded Bam Bam Rios. Brandon Flab Flab Rios. And this was, of course, the first fight with Teddy Atlas. And, of course, Teddy gave the great fireman speech, which, you know, look, from, from ringside, I could see Teddy yelling and spit flying out of his face, and, but I couldn't tell what the hell he was saying. I started, you know, later on that night when I was writing my articles and stuff, you know, I started to see stuff on my Twitter and little videos were being posted. It was absolutely hilarious. The pairing has worked so far, right? Really, really great pairing, but let's not get too excited, okay? That's kind of the theme of this week's episode. Let's not get too excited, guys. Rios was made to order. The whole reason I thought this thing was going to be competitive is because I expected Rios to be in good shape. Well, he wasn't, which seems to be a trend in Robert Garcia's gym. That's an issue with Robert Garcia and that gym up in Oxnard, California. It's something that they need to address. But look, if you're a young fighter and you're looking for a place to get good sparring, Garcia's gym is great. But if you're looking for a place that's going to help you get in shape, going to help you uh, prepare for the toughest fight of your career possibly, not the best gym in L.A., not even close. But for Rios, I'm sorry, for Bradley, really, really great game plan. Obviously, they saw the way in results and they went right to that body. Bradley had this move. He started first jabbing and keeping his head low, his right shoulder down when he jab, and then he come with these straight right hands right to the gut. He started doing that early. Then what he started doing was this pivot over to the right and a hard left hook to the gut. So he was working both sides of Rio's gut, and it took an effect, man. Uh, you know, in the, I thought the second round, even the beginning of the third round, I thought Rios was starting to press a little bit. And, and Bradley was losing a little bit of focus. But Bradley kept going to the body. And there was one shot, I want to say in the third round, that just, you saw Rios kind of go, oh, shit. And things were different after that. And each round progressively, as Rios was supposed to be the guy coming on, it was Bradley getting stronger and looking better. And anytime Bradley kind of lost focus and started to coast, because that's what he does, he gets a little, I don't want to say lazy, because there's nothing lazy about Tim Bradley, but he gets a little unfocused. Atlas would reel him in and give his little speeches, you know. And look, a lot of you guys out there are saying that Atlas does all that for the, uh, for the cameras. I think Atlas is aware that the cameras are there, but... Here's what I say to that. After the fight, I, I, I really noticed something that when, uh, you know, I couldn't really hear because I was ringside, the place was loud, but I looked up, you know, on the like the Jumbotron thing and um, you could see HBO's shot. They show it up on, on top. And I noticed that when they were interviewing Bradley after the fight, when um, Max Kellerman was interviewing Bradley, Teddy Atlas stepped off to the side put his hands behind his back and just kind of stood there, didn't say nothing. Max had to go fetch Atlas. Teddy was real cool about stepping to the side and letting Tim Bradley have his moment. And I thought that was really, really cool. Now on the other side, when Rios was being interviewed, Garcia was hugging up on him, made sure that face was in the camera. And look, Robert Garcia is a really good guy and he didn't mean anything by that. He wasn't trying to get face time. But some of you, I think, are being a little too hard on Atlas and think, you know, by saying he plays it all up for the cameras. If that's really his intention, then after that fight, while Max was interviewing Tim Bradley, I think Atlas would have kind of got in the camera shot and started talking. And, you know, he didn't do any of that. So I, I don't know. I, I thought Atlas really, really um, had Bradley's best interest at heart. And um, as Tim mentioned, 
in the post-fight interview, they're gonna work together again. They've agreed, you know, this was kind of an experiment. Experiment went well, so they're gonna work together again. So, what's next for Bradley? Well, he is an outsider in the Pacquiao sweepstakes. That is a possibility. Um, I know a lot of fans out there just have zero interest in that fight. Amir Khan's also a possibility, and of course, Terrence Crawford, who's the guy that I want to win that sweepstakes, and a lot of diehard fans want to see. But Bradley does have a shot. Atlas has gone on record saying he wants Floyd Mayweather. We all know Floyd Mayweather is coming back next spring. At least that's the scuttlebutt going around. And, you know, if I'm Bradley, I'm calling out Floyd. Because I think Floyd would take that fight. You know, when it comes to other top challenges for Mayweather, guys like Keith Thurman, guys like Gennady Golovkin, you know, Bradley matches up better for Floyd than those guys do. I think, you know, again, I'm a big Tim Bradley fan, but just the style matchup, I think Floyd wins that fight against Bradley. However, Bradley would provide probably the best challenge that Floyd has had since Miguel Cotto. Uh, because the Canelo Alvarez that Floyd fought was way too green for that fight. I called a 12-round shutout the minute that fight was signed, and that's why Floyd fought him when he did. But Bradley would probably provide the best challenge since Miguel Cotto for Floyd, and also it would be pay-per-view worthy, and nobody could complain about the opponent. Tim Bradley is going to be a Hall of Famer when he retires. Got my vote. So for Floyd, that might be the best option, man. If I'm Bradley and I want that big payday, I start hollering at Floyd Mayweather. And speaking of Floyd Mayweather, where are all the Floyd fans when it comes to Timothy Bradley? You know, I talked last week's episode, I think it was, about uh, Terrence Crawford. Where's all the Floyd fans? You know, your boy's retired now. Why aren't you on... The Terrence Crawford bandwagon. Why aren't you on the Timothy Bradley bandwagon? Is it just because they're with top rank? So you're going to let their promoter keep you from being a fan of these guys? Because Terrence Crawford and Timothy Bradley are willing to fight anybody. They're entertaining. They're humble guys. They do it the old-fashioned way with hard work. What's not to like? All you Floyd fans who are depressed because your guy, quote-unquote, retired which we know he really didn't. There's these guys, Timothy Bradley, Terrence Crawford. Maybe you should look them up and watch some of their fights on YouTube. There's a couple guys you can, you know, jump on that bandwagon. Speaking of Crawford and Bradley, some of you out there have been suggesting that fight happen. Not going to happen. They're friends. They've made it very clear. Not going to happen. So get that out of your mind. And, I, I, again, I didn't watch the HBO broadcast, but I heard on Twitter that uh, the guys at HBO are suggesting Bradley versus Canelo at a catchweight. That is an awful, awful idea. And it's pathetic that they didn't even bring that up. Timothy Bradley is a small welterweight. Small welterweight, all right? He's uh, a natural 140. Canelo Alvarez, I think his 30-day weigh-in for the uh, Miguel Cotto fight it was a few weeks ago. I want to say he weighed in at like 165 or something like that. This is a guy who walks around 175, 180 between fights sometimes. They are in two different, no, two different sizes, all right? I don't even want to hear about that fight. I would be the first to shit on that fight if it ever got signed. And I can't believe the guys at HBO even suggested that. You know, Manny Pacquiao, imagine Manny Pacquiao in there with Canelo Alvarez, the size difference. Pacquiao is a blown up lightweight. That's how it would look with Bradley in there, except Bradley doesn't have the punching power or the strength that Pacquiao has. So just, you know, imagine that in your mind. Not a good look. Real quick before I wrap up, I, I want to uh, address something that you guys have talked about. Um, there was an announced crowd of 5,106 fans at the Thomas and Mack Center for Bradley Rios. And I'll tell you this, half of them didn't show up until the main event. Half of them didn't even watch the Lomachenko fight. They trickled in 
just as the main event was about to start, half of the crowd. Before that, it was probably 3,000 tops, you know, during the undercard. Um, this fight, you know, you guys have mentioned, it should have been in California, preferably at StubHub, where both Rios and Bradley had fights of the year, right? It should have been, but this is one of those things about boxing business. We're in the fourth quarter, it's the end of the year, and the site fee that top rank got to put that fight on in Vegas was huge. That's why they took it out there. Uh, Bradley's guaranteed purse was 1.9 million. I want to say Rios was around 800,000. Lomachenko around 750,000. To to get that that covered for the promoter, they had to go out to Vegas. Now they could have waited till January, February next year to put this fight on but i don't know the details of the contracts with the fighters and everything else they had the hbo date they kind of had to make this fight when they made it this is just part of the boxing business it's the way it happens but all in all for top rank man they have had a very poor 2015 and uh i'm not the only guy to talk about this you know my, my colleague steve kim for ucn uh he's talked about this a lot too where let's look at a guy like brandon rios who I think is very frustrated with top rank and just kind of the boxing business. And it has a, part, a, a big deal to do why he's retired. He's announced his retirement after the Bradley loss. Um, this guy fought in January in Denver against Mike Alvarado, who Alvarado was a shot fighter. Uh, I guess it just kind of was contagious and Rios picked that up. But I was ringside for that one in Denver. And Rios looked pretty sharp. He looked in shape, he made weight, there was no issue. But he sat idle for 10 months. And Rios is one of those guys who's not very disciplined, you know, likes to eat, likes to drink beer, kind of lazy between fights. And if he doesn't fight every few months, if he's not in a, in a in camp every few months, he blows up. And having a 10-month layoff, blowing up to 190 pounds, you know, that did him in. So top rank has had a rough year. It wasn't just with you know Brandon Rios and Mike Alvarado. You know they lost two guys right there where there was options, but um, you know Ruslan Provodnikov and other fighters. Terence Crawford, fighter of the year last year, fights twice this year against nondescript opponents. Right, uh, Manny Pacquiao had a bad year. He had a terrible performance against Floyd Mayweather, blamed it on a shoulder injury, and then he's been hiding out. Over there in the Philippines, he claims some magic water healed his shoulder. He's crazy. So Top Rank's had a rough year. They need to come back next year with a vengeance. Even though Golden Boy Promotions has lost in recent big bouts that they've had, you think of Lucas Matisse, you think of uh, David Lemieux, they are still the promoter of the year for making the fights fans want to see and keeping their fighters active. And I think they're going to do just fine next week when uh, Saul Canelo Alvarez fights, fights against Miguel Cotto. I think they're going to do just fine because I like Canelo in that fight.